Okay, this is the recorded take home lecture for growth and metabolism. I'm actually going to break it down, I believe, into three segments. And um, at the end of it, I'm going to talk to you about a potential extra credit opportunity. So, to start this first section, I want to just do a little bit of a background on nutrition. This lecture is kind of a follow-up to our GI lecture, and in our GI lecture we talked a lot about um, how we get our food digested and absorbed. And, and so what I want to talk a little bit about in this nutrition component of this lecture is those nutrients that we absorb and what, what, how they work for us in our body. So we know that um, the energy of our body is ATP and we have to make that ATP. So the energy that we ultimately need to make the ATP comes from the food that we eat. So our big, those big macromolecules, the carbohydrates, the fats, and the proteins, what they do for us once they're digested and then absorbed, those simple sugars, fatty acids, um, amino acids, etc. what they do is they work for us and we, we essentially can use those building blocks to either make ATP in the case of um, fats and proteins and carbs. We focused in our class per per particularly, pardon me, on glucose, but we can use other sources of energy as well, or other sources, I should say, to manufacture energy. Um, and if we don't eat the food, so if we're not getting those things from the food that we're eating, then we're going to get those things from our body tissues. So we're going to break down our body tissues ultimately to, you know, yield, to liberate those things that we're going to need to ultimately make ATP. So you probably learned this somewhere, but just in case you didn't, we talk about the, or we measure, I should say, the energy value in our food as a kilocalorie. So one kilocalorie is equivalent to um, a thousand calories, and one calorie is the amount of energy needed to raise uh, one cubic centimeter of water one degree Celsius. You don't need to remember that for this class, but you, you probably learned about that in basic biology. So we know that different types of, of, of building blocks, like carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, uh, provide different amounts of, of energy, essentially, or equivalent to different amounts of energy. So just as an example, a gram of carbohydrates or a gram of protein is equivalent to four kilocalories or, or 4,000 calories. Um, and remember that ca all the calorie, the kilocalorie is, is the energy value in the food. A gram of fat, it would yield nine kilocalories. So if you recall when we were talking in uh, early on in the semester about how much energy we can get out of different, from different types of molecules, I said that fats are the highest y energy yield. And you can see, and, and just like I just said, so for a gram of carbs, you get a four kilocalories for a gram of fats. You can, you can get nine kilocalories. So, so fats are, are a more energy dense material, I guess you could say. All right, so um, we're going to be talking about metabolism and metabolic rate, and and I want to just again talk a little bit about caloric requirements. So. Um, our metabolic rate is measured by the amount of heat generated um, in terms of oxygen consumed per minute. So the, the amount of heat generated or the amount of oxygen consumed per minute essentially is what metabolic rate is. And so oftentimes we, you hear the term BMR or the basal metabolic rate. And the BMR is the amount of oxygen that's consumed by a relaxed person at a comfortable temperature um, 12 to 14 hours after eating. Of course, metabolic rate is going to be increased by exercise or by eating, 
Um, and the, the body temperature is, is really an important factor here. Um, body temperature, of course, temperature, it, 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 of course, influences reaction rates, which we've talked about previously when we were talking about enzymes, right? Enzymes are doing all this work. So we have enzymes that are facilita facilitating all of these biochemical reactions that are happening in order for us to make energy and, you know, break things down and build things up, essentially. Um, there's an area in our brain, in the hypothalamus, that um, essentially controls our body temperature. It's our body temperature, our thermoregulatory set point is located in the hypothalamus. And um, it, that, that, that control center in the hypothalamus can, can, can correct any deviations by, you know, directing physiologic responses, things like, you know, sweating and shivering. We talked about that earlier in the semester. So our basal metabolic rate is influenced by um, our age, our sex, our body surface area, and our thyroid activity. Um, the thyroid gland, if you recall, is the gland, the endocrine gland that basically sets and maintains our basal metabolic rate. So the energy requirement for a human can has a pretty broad range, and you can see it can range from anywhere between 1,300 and 5,000 kilocalories per day. The average male requires about 2,900 kilocalories per day, and the average female uh, requir requirement is about 2,100 kilocalories per day. And of course, that would be adjusted based on you know the physical activity, the the, um, meta the, the thyroid activity, or, or you know the size of of the person, and all of those sorts of things. So, building up that term anabolic means to build. So the requ anabolic requirements, uh, again, our food is going to supply us the, the majority of our materials, the raw materials that we need to build all the stuff in our body. The important stuff like our DNA, our RNA, proteins, and triglycerides. Um, most of our fatty acids and amino acids can actually be made by the body. If there's a nutrient that cannot be synthesized in the body, then that nutrient is called an essential nutrient. And in those in those cases, and I'll give you there are essential nutrient our essential nutrients on the next slide, but in those cases, our diet is the only source of those nutrients. So it's good to know what those are, so you can make sure that your diet is is um, replete in those essential nutrients. Um, okay. That's enough of that, I suppose. Okay, so here's our essential nutrients, and they are there's nine essential amino acids. You don't need to memorize these. Um, they're lysine, tryptophan, phenylalanine, threonine, valine, methionine, leucine, isoleucine, and histidine. So those are the nine essential amino acids. That means that you have to get that those amino acids must be sourced in your diet because your body can't make them on its own. There's also two essential fatty acids. And that should say, um, my spell check changed that, and I didn't catch it, sorry. Um, uh, that should say lino, linoleic and linolenic, not linoleum. Um, linoleic acid is an omega-6 fatty acid, and linolenic acid is an omega-3 fatty acid. All right, so those are the essential nutrients. That means you have to get those from your diet. I want to talk just a little bit about vitamins and minerals in this in this particular presentation. So a vitamin is a small organic molecule that serves as a coenzyme, or if it doesn't serve as a coenzyme, it performs um, some specific biological function, and most of those sort of facilitate these chemical reactions that are happening in the body. Um, we our vitamins must be obtained by the by our diet. Um, the body can't make them. It, with the exception of, there are a few exceptions to that. The body can make um, a small amount of vitamin D, also vitamin K and vitamin B. But the Ks and the Bs, if you remember from our, lac our lecture on the GI tract, B vitamins and K vitamins are made in the large intestine by, it's really the bacteria in the gut that are making those vitamins. So they're made in the body, but they're made by the bacteria. Um, our uh, vitamins get divided into two classes, the fat-soluble vitamins, and those are A, D, E, and K, and the water-soluble vitamins, which are um, vitamins, all the B vitamins, and uh, vitamin C. So I want to talk to you about these real quickly. So the uh, water-soluble vitamins, again, the Bs and the C, and, and vitamin C, 
because they're water soluble, they don't get stored in the body because they can't get out of the plasma and into the uh, body cells. So they don't get stored in the body. They're used by the body, but they are they they don't get they don't get into long term storage. Essentially, they don't get stored in our fat. Um, B1 is thiamine, and I'm just going to give you a rundown on, on some of some of the important. There's other roles that these things play, but these are sort of the the important ones. So thiamine, which is vitamin B1, is needed to convert pyruvate into acetyl CoA. That's a, vit a vitamin B1 dependent step. And remember that conversion of pyruvate to acetyl CoA is the one that happens in the uh, cytoplasm of the cell, and it is what allows that acetyl CoA to enter into the Krebs cycle. So it's a really important um, pre-Krebs cycle vitamin. So it's really important for energy production, ultimately. Um, niacin, which is B3, and riboflavin, which is B2, those are needed to make our electron transporters. Remember FAD and NAD? Um, NAD comes from niacin, B3, and FAD comes from riboflavin, B2. And those those coenzymes. So remember, those are those guys were called coenzymes, and they were our electron and um, our electron and hydrogen carriers, right? They were our electron shuttles. So those coenzymes act as as electron carriers in cellular respiration, and those are really important. And we know that they're loaded up um, in in both glycolysis and also in the Krebs cycle. And they are, their job is to shuttle those electrons to the last and final step, which is where we make the predominant, predominant amount of our energy um, in that oxidative phosphorylation step. Um, B6 is another very important, or pyridoxine is another important vi um, vitamin, B vitamin. Um, and it's needed for proper amino acid metabolism, which is really important. So B6 is, is, it has all sorts of really important roles in the body around amino acid metabolism. And then, of course, vitamin C. You've all heard about vitamin C, I'm sure. It's a very potent antioxidant. I'm going to talk more about antioxidants in a moment. Um, but what antioxidants do in a, in a nutshell is they uh, kind of quench the uh, formation of free radicals. And we know that free radicals are implicated in all sorts of all sorts of chronic diseases, which I'll have I have a slide on in a second for you. Um, before we do that, I want to talk about the fat soluble vitamins. Again, they are A, D, E, and K. They are stored very nicely in the body because they're fat soluble, so they get stored in our fat tissue. Um, again, E, uh, pardon me, um, D and um, can be made a little bit by the body, and K is made um, by our by our prim primarily by the, the bacteria in our gut. Our liver um, is plays a role in the activation of vitamin K. So, just some of the highlights of these fat soluble vitamins: e, vitamin E also is a very potent antioxidant, really helps um, kind of control the inflammatory response. Vitamin K, among other things, is needed to make clotting factors. You also need K for adequate D for, uh, function. So vitamin K and D kind of need to both be present for both of these vitamins to work efficiently, but especially for vitamin D. Vitamin D seems to do everything. And we know, we've always known that vitamin D is needed for adequate calcium absorption. So in order to absorb calcium from your diet, from your, from your intestines, you need to have vitamin D available. Um, we know that vitamin D, it, it, is more than just a vitamin, it also acts like a hormone and it plays a role in our ability of our tissues to differentiate and become specialized. And it also plays a role in uh, the regulation of our gene expression. So vitamin D is really acts more like a hormone than it does a vitamin. And vitamin A is another one that's really important. Um, it's important early in embryonic development. It's important in um, adequate T cell activity. And the T cells are the ones that are playing a role in um, our specific immune response. The T cells are the cells that are responsible for like going after um, bacterially infected cells and you know cause, causing like cellular warfare and popping cell membranes of bacteria, et cetera. Um, vitamin A is also really important in vision. Um, if you remember, we talked a little bit about retinine when we were talking about um, the rods, and uh, the vitamin retinine was a vitamin A derivative. 
and vitamin A is also really important for all of our epithelial cells. It, it helps to control the development of epithelial cells. So in, um, t in, in epithelial cell, uh, either uh, too active turnover or if there's been any, any trauma or damage to epithelial cell layers, vitamin A is necessary to, for the healing of, of all of the, this, these epithelial linings. So it's a really important vitamin as well. Um, I've gave you, you, this is small, but you can, you have it if you want it. Certainly don't memorize this, but I kind of gave you a chart from the Fox textbook, which um, gives you an idea of the vitamins. That's most of the ones we just talked about and a couple others. And um, in addition to that, where you might find them in food and what their functions are, um, a little bit more detail perhaps than what I just gave you. And then some of the kinds of things that you would potentially see if somebody has a deficiency in these vitamins. Um, all right, so you can, that's for your own good if you like it. Minerals, so both deficiency in vitamins and minerals can cause all sorts of diseases. And minerals are non-organic molecules that are used as cofactors in a whole bunch of different processes. Um, they are needed in large amounts, or some of them, are, pardon me, are needed in large amounts. The big ones that are needed in large amounts are sodium and potassium, magnesium, phosphorus, calcium, and chloride. chloride um, <coughs> excuse me, chloride. That should say chloride. Um, in small amounts, we need the trace elements, and those are things like iron, zinc, manganese, fluorine, copper, molybdenum, chromium, and selenium. Um, so, you know, kind of historically, we've said that deficiencies in vitamins and minerals are rare outside of the developing nations, um, unless somebody suffers from conditions where you would normally expect to see vitamin deficiencies, like alcoholism. People that are alcoholics tend to be very deficient in specifically the Bs. Um, people who have uh, some of our irritable bowel diseases, like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, but most specifically with Crohn's because it affects the small intestine, predominantly where the or ulcerative colitis affects the large intestine. So with the large intestine, remember, we absorb water and some electrolytes. So you might you'll, you could potentially see some of the big mineral deficiencies, but not as many vitamin deficiencies um, with, with ulcerative colitis. But I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't say that you wouldn't see any. But definitely with Crohn's disease, there's lots of vitamin and mineral deficiencies because of the uh, inability to absorb. And then other things like... Um, if somebody's got some eating disorders, specifically anorexia and bulimia, or someone's you know actually starving, of course they're going to be de deplete in vitamins and minerals. But kind of historically, we've said that we don't see as much vitamin and mineral deficiency in this in, in outside of developing countries. Um, there, there is some there's some pretty interesting discussions around, especially minerals and um, the fact that. Our soils are pretty deplete currently in minerals, right? The, the minerals are usually a, a reservoir for, or pardon me, soil, I should say, is a reservoir for many of these minerals. And if the if the soil is deplete of things like selenium is the thing I'm thinking about specifically, um, uh, and, and some of the other trace minerals, but definitely selenium is one that's pretty well studied. And if the soil is deplete, then... Um, we don't, we, we, you know, the source is, is, is depleted. And so there, there is a, a, a potential that you might have a person that doesn't have the selenium levels or some of these trace minerals that they, they need. All right. So lastly, the free radicals, again, a free radical is a molecule, a very unstable molecule, and it has unpaired electrons. So it's like always looking to grab electrons from something else. So oftentimes we call these things reactive oxygen species, and they are produced normally in the as a byproduct of the electron transport chain, especially if the electron transport chain is running really fast. Um, the superoxide radical, which is O2, and the hydroxyl radical, which is HO, um, with the with again with an unpaired both in both cases an unpaired electron. Those are the two that are produced with uh, as a result of the electron transport chain. Um, especially if that electron transport chain is running really fast. 
Uh, we also have a reactive nitrogen species, species, which is a nitric oxide radical, again, with an unpaired electron. And um, what we know about these guys is these free radicals, they do seem to serve a role in the immune response in phagocytic cells. Um, nitric oxide specifically is a vasodilator. We talked about that, if you remember. Um, so th so it's, we, we kind of are conditioned to think that re free radicals are always bad, which they're not always bad, but they definitely need to be kind of kept in check. And that's where those antioxidants come in, like vitamin A, and, or pardon me, vitamin C and vitamin E, right? They quench these things. They, they, they you know, provide the... the, the electron that's that they're sort that's that the free radical is searching for so I just gave you like a little visual here in terms of um, the what sort of on the left there of this teeter-totter thing are sources of free radicals exogenous and endogenous so in the mitochondria right that's when we're talking about like this electron transport chain actually you know oxidative phosphorylation causing um, the production of reactive oxygen species, but we also know that when somebody's very inflamed, a lot of react reactive oxygen species are also produced. Um, and then we talked about some of the exogenous causes, which are things like UV light, ionizing radiation, lots of environmental toxins. And then on the far side of that teeter-tottery thing, you see our defenses, right? So we've got some enzymes that are antioxidants, like catalase, um, superoxide, dismutase, and kind of like the grandfather of all antioxidant enzymes is glutathione peroxidase. Glutathione is a potent antioxidant. It's the most potent antioxidant that we have. It uh, plays a role in uh, almost all of our detox pathways. Um, I mentioned vitamins C, E, and A. Those are our antioxidant vitamins. Um, we find lots of antioxidants in uh, vegetables, colored things, poly, the polyphenols that give our vegetables and fruits a lot of color. So those are potent antioxidants as well. Um, of course, too many free radicals cause oxidative stress, and that can damage proteins. They can da it can damage DNA. It can damage lipids. So it's not essentially that all free radicals and reaction reactive oxygen species are bad. It's just that we need to keep them in balance, right? Of course, when it gets out of balance, that's going to pr um, promote things like cell death. Um, you know, a lot of the processes that are associated with the degeneration that we see with aging cancers, inflammatory diseases, cardiovascular diseases, you know, neurologic diseases, etc. All right, so that's um, where antioxidants come in. And again, their job is to protect against oxidative stress. And I mentioned those enzymes, you don't need to memorize them. Um, glutathione, which is a really important tripeptide that reacts with free radicals. Um, it's our major antioxidant. We want to make sure that we have the glutathione around. Just as a um, as an aside, glutathione is produced in our body. You can you can ramp up your glutathione production one by consuming whey protein. Whey protein is a precursor to glutathione. So is N-acetylcysteine. Um, B, C, vitamin C and vitamin E as antioxidants. Vitamin antioxidants they picked up they pick up those unpaired electrons. And like I said, vitamins or fruits and vegetables that are brightly colored are very high in antioxidants. They contain, contain molecules called polyphenols, which are, you know, are oxidative stress quenchers. So we want to make sure that we have all of that stuff in our diet. So that's just a little primer on basic human nutrition. Of course, there's a ton to human nutrition and that's you know, the bare minimum. But the reason why, again, we're talking about that today is because we just talked about digestion and absorption. And, and again, again, the reason why we eat food and we digest food and then ultimately absorb it is to get these, these nutrients into our body, these vitamins, these minerals, all these things to make sure that we can make energy effectively and, you know, decrease some of these deleterious effects of too much oxidative stress. So I'm going to end this video here and I'm going to pick up the next one with the regulation of, of, of pardon me, energy metabolism.